In chapter 4, consider states of consciousness, everything from being awake to any sort of substance-induced level of consciousness. Now, a basic question of consciousness focuses on how it is that we come to know ourselves. Advocates of mind-altering substances or devotees of certain mystic rites point to what's called the expanded consciousness and greater awareness of ourselves that can be attained, and almost everyone embraces the admonition to quote-unquote know thyself. Now, the framework suggested by these examples, however, recruits a rather select group of self-knowers. Sentient, rational adults with long prior experience from any number of sources of acquiring self-knowledge. Now, an investigation of the origins and the limits of self-knowledge, however, might entail what's called a phylogenetic or an ontogenetic approach. For example, how much self-recognition does an infant have? Certainly a pre-verbal child cannot describe his or her experience of the self, and if a child could, its vocabulary would probably be inadequate. It wouldn't be able to capture the richness of the self-recognition experience. Now imagine that you have a two-year-old, and that two-year-old is reporting that she apprehended the self as known in a moment of lucid insight. Now to press the point further, to what extent are members of other species self-aware? We can repeatedly ask the two-year-old child what he or she is experiencing until, with time, of vocabulary that's capable of describing the experiences is developed. We can't, however, expect that our cat will relate to the reflective experience of comparing the present self to the ideal self, no matter how much we ask. Several researchers have been interested in questions of self-recognition, self-awareness, and self-knowledge in other species, and have actively sought ways to gather evidence for these processes. As an example, Gordon G. Gallup, Jr. He developed a technique for testing self-recognition among primates that we circumvented the barrier produced by the lack of common communication systems between species. Now, one marker of self-recognition is the ability to visually identify oneself, such as what occurs when looking in the mirror. Gallup capitalized on this facet of recognition in a study using chimpanzees. The chimps were given several days of exposure to a mirror in their environment, <clears throat> and Gallup noted that at first the chimpanzees acted as though the image in the mirror was some other sort of animal. Gradually, however, they began to respond in a way that suggested that they had realized they were seeing an image of themselves. To validate these observations, Gallup anesthetized the chimpanzees and applied an odorless, bright red dye to their faces in such a location that it could only be seen in the mirror. When the chimpanzees were revived, the mirrors were reintroduced and all the chimpanzees reacted in a way that strongly, strongly suggested in the mirror that they were recognizing themselves. Now the chimps reached up to their faces, they explored the marks, and while watching their own reflections, they did so more often than under any other controlled circumstance. Now the procedure, subsequently dubbed the mark test or the mirror test, has been used with a number of other species as well. Gallup contends, however, that although chimpanzees and orangutans can relatively demonstrate self-recognition of this type, the effect has not been reliably demonstrated among gorillas, monkeys, prosimians. Nonetheless, more research has demonstrated self-recognition among bottlenose dolphins, Asian elephants, magpies, ants, and even orca whales. Whether we consider information related to bottlenose dolphins, Asian elephants, magpies, birds, snakes, or any other sort of animal in the animal kingdom. The $64,000 question is, what is consciousness? Now, from a definitive perspective, the definition of consciousness is what we call a person's awareness of and responses to mental processes and the environment. Just bear in mind that the majority of waking hours are spent in what we call waking consciousness. Now, altered states of consciousness, on the other hand, are shifts in the quality or pattern of those mental activities. 
Stated another way, being conscious is simply the awareness and the response to experiences you're having in your own specific environment. Now, circadian rhythms, on the other hand, are endogenous rhythms that occur every 24 hours, which is basically what we call the body clock. The circadian rhythms are controlled by a master biological clock located in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's also placed in the hypothalamus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus regulates neurotransmitters and hormones, which provide feedback to that particular neurotrans... I'm sorry, the neurotransmitters supply feedback back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which then affect its function. <clears throat> now, ticking away, just like so much metaphorical spring work, our biological clocks help keep our sleep and wake cycles in order. Most of the time they operate unnoticed. They bid us to go to sleep or arouse us to be awake. But what we don't feel particular, when we don't feel particularly healthy, wealthy or wise, however, we may notice that the biological clock needs winding. And for certain reasons, it comes because of our own drowsiness. The culprit may be an unexpected one. Industrial advance may have unwittingly turned us into species of sleep deprived zombies. Now, biological clocks do get out of sync occasionally, and a great deal of previous research has shown that exposure to bright light can reset the body's internal clock. Therapies for seasonal affective disorder, in fact, capitalize on exposure to bright light as a means of treating this form of depression. However, a study by Dr. Charles Sesler of Boston's Brigham and Women's Hospital suggests that exposure to normal levels of indoor lighting may also have similar effects. Sesler led a five-year study on human response to light in which he and his colleagues discovered that as little as five hours a day of exposure to normal levels of illumination can alter the biological pattern of sleep and wakefulness. Over time, the phase of peak grogginess gets shifted to just a few hours before waking. The result is a constant feeling of being run down or jet lagged. Now, what's to blame? Well, with the advent of the light bulb came the ability to accomplish much more using artificial light. No longer constrained to work when the sun was up and rest when it wasn't, humans could go about their way of staying up well past their bedtimes, as it were. In short, the light bulb allows us to read or to work or play Parcheesi or any other game or read to any other book until very late at night. Then significantly, it slows the ticking of our biological clocks. Now the problem with comp that's compounded by the use of heavy shades in the bedroom to block out the dawn's early light could also serve to help reset the biological clock. Now, steps toward cleaning the clockwork would be to avoid bright lights just before bedtime, as well as setting and maintaining a regular sleep schedule. Now, just so you know, when it comes to sleep and the circadian rhythm, my suspicion is that the majority of the students in this class don't get enough rest. That's part of living in this contemporary culture, 2021. You have all kinds of other concerns that you're dealing with on a consistent basis. However, research does show that if you spend many, if you spend too much time, certainly late at night, looking at blue screens or computers, iPads, phones, whatever other sort of tablet or other instrument you might have, chances are you are going to disrupt your biological clock to some degree or other, which will then influence your sleep and awake cycle, which will likely leave you feeling jet lagged or at least dr dragging to some extent. Now, when it comes to sleep specifically, there are four different rhythms of sleep. Now, stage one is what we call light sleep and our body produces theta waves. The second stage of sleep is we refer to as having sleep spindles. Those are also put out by theta waves. When we move into the third stage of sleep, we have moved into a deeper sleep in which we are encountering delta waves. And then we enter REM sleep, REM sleep, which is also called rapid eye movement sleep, which is when we are dreaming. Now, each one of those stages of sleep has its own particular characteristics. 
There is also a state of sleep just before one officially drops off to sleep that we might even consider some level of waking consciousness of some sort. I'm sure you've been aware of when you've been trying to go to sleep and your body jerks real quickly for whatever reason. Your brain is trying to catch up with your body or maybe vice versa. Your body's trying to go to sleep and your brain is saying, no, wait a minute. Those sorts of things can be very uncomfortable for some of us. Now, sleep depression, or not depression, but sleep deprivation, uh, please understand that between one third and one half of all adults will regularly fail to get enough sleep. Why is for any number of reasons. Lack of sleep contributes to any assorted serious health problems, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, all kinds of other conditions. Sleep deprivation can also disrupt learning as well as memory. Your body requires sleep in order to consolidate memory. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. There are a number of different types of sleep disorders, some of which you encounter at much younger ages than others. Nightmares, for example, everybody knows what one of those is. It's a bad or disturbing, horrifying, unsettling dream of some sort. A night terror, on the other hand, typically is more prominent in children than in adults. And what will usually happen is that the child will wake up screaming as if they've lost all of their limbs in some way or other. Sleepwalking, which is also called Sonambulism is an interesting sleep disorder. If you, perhaps you have children who have difficulty sleeping from time to time and sleepwalk. I had one of those. My wife was also a sleepwalker when she was much younger. Another disorder, insomnia, which is basically the inability to get to sleep or to stay asleep once you've dropped off. Some of you may have parents who experience what we call sleep apnea which is the cessation of breathing for short periods of sleep time. My father-in-law had sleep apnea for many, many years before it was diagnosed. He could literally sit down in a chair and drop off to sleep. Um, he had a couple of other challenges that related to that disorder as well, which made his life miserable until they were able to figure out what his problem was. One of those concerns that my father-in-law experienced is another disorder called narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is when a person suddenly falls asleep in an inappropriate circumstance. In other words, they sit down to the dinner table or they sit down to a fine meal in a restaurant and they get comfortable and drop off to sleep. Um, another condition called cataplexy occurs usually along with narcolepsy. Now, cataplexy is when the body use, loses all of its muscle tone, which means then if a person is sitting in a chair and drops off to sleep because of narcolepsy, it is quite possible that the person's body will lose its muscle tone and literally slump off into the floor because there's nothing holding it together. The muscles quit working. Now I'm going to give you information related to dreaming. Dreams are by definition visual and often auditory experiences that our minds create during sleep. Sigmund Freud referred to dreams as unconscious wishes. He also referred to it as the royal road to the unconscious. In dreams, for at least Freud, in his perspective, we are expressing unconscious wishes or desires. And for Freud and his dream interpretation, what he talked about was manifest content. It's what we experience and remember from the dream or latent content, which is hidden and symbolic which would include those unconscious wishes. Now, of course, many contemporary folks disagree with Freud's interpretation. What many researchers from the contemporary setting have understood is that dreams are also involved with information processing. There are physiological and informational processing approaches to cognition as well as dreams. And what often happens related to dreams, according to some contemporary researchers, is that the unnecessary neural connections that are found in the brain are often eliminated and other neural connections that are more important are strengthened. As a result, we also dream. Dreams are the remains of that sorting, scanning, and sifting of information and that process related to it. Now, when it comes to dreams and waking life, Dreams are an altered extension of the conscious concerns of waking life. In other words, I'm sure many of you have encountered the notion of deja vu. It happened to me just a couple, three days ago. I was 
I forgot exactly where I was, but I walked through a store or something to that effect and chuckled and said, I've already been here once, making reference to a time that I had dreamed it recently. Um, dreams are also strongly related, of course, to neural activity in the brain. The activation synthesis theory suggests that dreams are the results of neurons firing spontaneously in the lower brain, which is down in the ponds, that are sent to the cortex, and then signals from the ponds have no meaning. But the cortex tries to synthesize that information anyway. Have you ever spoken with anyone who's had a lucid dream? Now, a lucid dream is one in which the dreamer becomes consciously aware that he or she is dreaming. So you're dreaming about the fact that you're dreaming. If one is able to be consciously aware of when one is dreaming, then it's also possible that one may exert conscious influence on one's dream to essentially control what happens in the dream. Stephen LeBurge and his colleagues developed a set of procedures to examine lucid dreaming. In these particular procedures, the dreamer would be able to communicate to the researcher when she was dreaming. Usually, the signal involves moving one's eyes repeatedly from left to right to a set number of experiences. This would be a signal that the dreamer was consciously aware of the dreaming. Likewise, researchers could also signal to the participant when she entered REM sleep. Using various psychological measures, researchers could then track in relatively real time the brain activity when one was dreaming lucidly. These periods of lucid dreaming occurred during REM sleep, refuting the theory that lucid dreams were really quote unquote micro awakenings during the night when one just thinks they're dreaming, but when they really are simply awake. Other researchers have reported that lucid dreams can have a therapeutic function, such as quelling nightmares and increasing the immune system function. Linda Capelreal is a behavioral psychologist, and she may have actually found a possible explanation for the strange behaviors that started the famous Salem witch trials in 1692. Yes, we're changing gears again, and we're moving into altered states of consciousness. Now, what Corporeal writes is this. Ergot poisoning, which is a fungus that's related to mushrooms. Ergot poisoning can't even explain all of the events at Salem. Some of the behaviors exhibited by the witch accusers probably were the result of mass hysteria or outright fakery. At the end of June and the beginning of July, 1692, I think there was more imagination than ergot. But by that point in time, three people, no, these three witches, had already been hanged and the trials had taken a path that people felt they had to stay on. Corporeal said, one of the clearest examples is the young accuser who, in the late summer, said, wait a minute, I don't think that there are witches after all. At that point, the other girls began accusing her of being a witch, and she immediately seemed to understand what was going on and became an accuser once again. Now, Corporeal was a senior in college writing a research paper for a history class and noticed the link between some strange symptoms that were reported by Salem's accusers, primarily these eight younger women, and the hallucinogenic effects of drugs such as LSD, which is, by the way, a derivative of ergot. It's a fungus that affects rye grain, for example. Ergotism, or ergot poisoning, had indeed been implicated in other outbreaks of bizarre behavior, such as the one that affected a small French town in 1951. Conditions at that time were necessary for the development of ergot poisoning. They were present at the time of the accusations of witchcraft and when they first began. Toxicologists now know that eating ergot contaminated food can lead to a convulsive disorder. Now, the symptoms of this disorder include violent muscle spasms, vomiting, delusions, hallucinations, crawling sensations on the skin, and a host of other symptoms, all of which were presented as evidence against the witches at those witch trials. So, that being said, altered states of consciousness, 
going back to the reference to the derivative of ergot, LSD, psychoactive drugs are drugs that change mood or alter one's perception. Alcohol, for example, has a very long history to it. There are many other substances that have been used in religious rituals or were culturally approved as psychoactive. More recently, drug use meaning as well as type has changed. Now for a, definitions, uh, a definition perspective on what constitutes an addiction versus substance abuse, addiction requires some level of physical dependence. Drugs that are physically addictive will cause the, the user's body to crave the drug. And when deprived of the drug, the user will go through physical withdrawal. Drug tolerance occurs when the drug becomes conditioned to the level of the drug. When the body becomes conditioned to the level of the drug. Over time, the user must then, of course, have more and more of the drug to get the same effect. Now, there are a number of ways that you can study the, the effects of certain drugs. You can use what's called a double blind procedure. That's when some participants receive the substance, whereas other participants receive a placebo. You can use PET scans, which provide an intriguing window into addiction because you can see certain parts of the brain. Now, categories of drugs are also varied. Depressants will decrease the activity of the nervous system. By the way, alcohol is the most commonly used and abused depressant. It affects perception, motor processes, memory and judgment. Binge drinking has become prevalent on many college campuses. Now, the fun thing about those who consume lots of alcohol, first of all, I've been there, done that. Um, but what happens, alcohol influences neurotransmitters in your prefrontal cortex. In your prefrontal cortex, there exists your inhibitive characteristics. In other words, the ability to control one's behavior to some degree or other. Alcohol lessens that, which means that people become far less inhibited. In other words, they're prone to do things when drinking, certainly excessively, that they would not do if they were sober. Uh, there used to be a song that was prevalent when I was your age or younger about a lady who was drinking tequila. Um, she'd get up and dance on the table. I've heard or seen of other individuals who have done just as interesting uh, behaviors as that before. Being in the military, I've seen people consume more alcohol than you can probably imagine, and people will do the strangest things when they've been drinking. Again, that's because that inhibition has gone away. Now, depressants, again, alcohol is a depressant. Many people feel a whole lot better, as it were, but it still is noted as being a depressant. Barbiturates, that's not a term that most of us hear as it relates to drug use too much anymore. They're also known as major tranquilizers. They have, of course, a sedative effect. Minor tranquilizers, tranquilizers, sorry, are benzodiazepines, such as Valium or Xanax. Opiates are pain relieving drugs that are derived from the opium poppy. Opium directly stimulates receptor sites for endorphins. Morphine is a more refined version of opium, but is very addictive. Heroin use is increasing sharply in the United States and is also highly addictive. Stimulants increase the activity of the human nervous system. Caffeine, for example, is the most commonly used stimulant. Nicotine is a mild stimulant and is very physically addictive. If you are a smoker or have been a smoker, you can attest to that. Amphetamines are synthetic drugs such as benzedrine or dexedrine. Cocaine is also highly addictive and can cause convulsions and death if a person consumes too much. Hallucinogens, like I mentioned early on, like LSD, are stimulants that distort visual and auditory perception. Synthetically created hallucinogens include LSD. Marijuana, oddly enough, is a natural occurring hallucinogen, which means that it, depending on the amount you smoke of marijuana or cannabis, whichever word you want to use, 
And depending upon how sensitive you may or may not be to that substance, you may experience hallucinations, meaning that you may see or hear things that other people don't. For any of you who smoke any of that sort of um, stimulant or hallucinogen at any time, take care of yourself in the midst of that use. You do not want to get caught driving under the influence. Now, when you were trying to explain abuse and addiction or the difference between the two, addiction includes biological, psychological, social, and cultural concerns. Now, that is not to say that abuse does not contain similar concerns, but go back to what I mentioned earlier. With addiction, there will, there will be biological and psychological as well as physical needs that must be met and must increase the use of the substance to maintain a certain type of high. And there also needs to have been some legal difficulty related to your drug use. As we get closer to the end of the chapter, I'm going to reference meditation as well as hypnosis. Now, when I'm making reference to hypnosis, it's important to remember I'm not talking about the type of hypnosis that you might see at a comedy club when people will experience all kinds of strange behavior. Please know that a person cannot be hypnotized unless they want to be hypnotized. If someone is willing to be hypnotized, it's, it's quite possible for them to create all kinds of behavior for them. Now, meditation can aid in coping with stressful situations and reduce chronic pain. Some people might refer to this meditation as prayerfulness in some way or other. Uh, there are a number of benefits that are comparable to other forms of relaxation. Many varieties exist when it comes to meditation or prayerfulness. You would use the word prayerfulness in the Christian tradition, or there's the Zen tradition, Sufism, Buddhism, Transcendentalism, any other numbers of different sorts of isms and practices that influence one's ability to meditate. Hypnosis, on the other hand, focuses on specific commands, the ability to relax, to release inhibitions and accept suggestions, as well as use one's imagination. Go back to what I just mentioned related to a person's willingness to be hypnotized. I'm pretty ornery in that way, so if I was to quote unquote, submit myself to some level of hypnosis, chances of me being able to be hypnotized are probably kind of slim. But if you look at hypnosis, as another modality related to uh, regression from a therapeutic perspective than I've been hypnotized before. Regressing is simply stepping back in time in one's mind, in one mind's eye to a, a place when you were younger, you regress to an earlier state of function. Get nice and relaxed, you are much more open to suggestion as well as the possibility of dealing with some of the concerns from the past that you're dredging up for yourself. That's not to say that your hypnotherapist is going to ask you to jump up and dance on the table. That would be inappropriate. But there are ways to get toward the notion of being hypnotized without actually quote unquote using hypnosis. Much of that technique is involved, uh, deals with regression. Now states of consciousness can be fun. We've got all kinds of ways to get to it different ways to understand it. But at the end of the day, it's important that we have some sort of conscious awareness of who we are in time and space. I'll check in with you for our next chapter.